Welcome to this special, very special online event of the Materials and Embodied Carbon Leaders Alliance, MECLA. Today's event is all about sharing what our do tank has been doing. We will hear about the fruits of our collaboration. My name is Hudson Worsley from Precinct, and I have the great pleasure of being the chair of MECLA and of hosting today's event. I'm joining you from Gadigal land of the Eora Nation, and I would like to acknowledge that we are all on Indigenous land around Australia. I pay my respect to Elders past and present and welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Welcome. Shortly, we will hear from our chairs and co-chairs of all of MECLA's, MECLA's working groups, our community. There's so much going on in MECLA that it can be hard to stay across all of the work that our wonderful members have been doing. So today we pause and have a chance to listen and then discuss what has been achieved. Today we'll also be interactive. So I'll set out how things will work. Please sign into Menti by scanning the QR code or going to the website. Alexi from our Secretariat is working the IT magic uh, behind the scenes and making sure that Menti will work for us. We'll have two questions for each working group. So please work through Menti alongside the working group presentations. You'll be able to watch the presentations and leave Menti on its holding slide until after each short session and then answer the questions for that working group. Questions will be the same for each one. Do you agree with the working group work plan? And what gaps do you see? What needs to be added uh, to the working group? We'll also create a Menti cloud map by asking what organization are you from? And we'll ask by Menti, how long have you been engaged with MECLA? So today is a fantastic opportunity to take stock of the collective influence that MECLA has on the construction and infrastructure ecosystem. When Monica Richter and I first set out what MECLA might look like, we hoped to bring 40 companies or, and organisations together. Two years on, we have over 150 participating organisations. We've talked about building momentum to drive action that will see cuts in, in the embodied carbon in our built environment. Now, it's, it's always hard to gauge impact when seeking systemic change, but there are several reference points that I think demonstrate that our collaborative power is having an influence. We started off by saying we want to see construction success measured in terms of time, cost, quality, and carbon. I've now heard that said by ministers, by chief executives, and by other advocacy bodies. We heard from Carlos Flores, a very collaborative director of Neighbours, who told us that his team wasn't planning on developing an embodied carbon tool for several years, but that the demonstration of demand and capacity through MECLA brought that forward and the development of the Neighbours embodied carbon module is well underway. Continuing the collaborative nature of MECLA, we've been working closely with Transport for New South Wales one of the leading public entities delivering sustainable infrastructure projects, and we're supporting one another's work. The Sustainability Committee of the Property Council of Australia has begun to bring a focus on embodied carbon into its work. The Australian Constructors Association also has a sustainability committee, and it too has begun to add embodied carbon to its remit. The APCC, the Australasian Procurement and Construction Council, is currently drafting a new pathway to green construction procurement for its members, and it includes how to address embodied carbon in the crucial procurement process. When undertaking the foundation research before setting up, also with Monica Richter, I heard several players on the supply side of aluminium say that there is no demand for low emission aluminium in Australia. Just two years later, we heard from Capital Aluminium, Australia's largest extruder, in our last spotlight, just last month, in that event saying it had recently launched to market two low carbon options, low cal green and low cal super green. And that was with no premium on the price. So clearly there is demand and now there's also some supply. 
Now, this isn't to claim credit for others' work and others' leadership inside their own organisations, but it is an indication that the momentum we sought to build truly is gathering pace. There are, of course, many factors leading to this growing momentum, but I want to highlight two that I think are foundations of why Meckler is special, our purpose and our collaboration. Our purpose is clear to drive reductions in embodied carbon in the building and construction industry to align with the Paris Agreement targets and the principles of the circular economy. We recognise that the building and construction sector is a complex ecosystem. That word complexity keeps coming up. I reckon that this pur purpose resonates at a personal level. As individuals, we want to make a positive difference. At a professional level, we want our skills and experience and our work to be of value and to contribute to climate solutions. And at an organisational level, we recognise that setting goals is part of what's needed, but that we can't achieve organisational emission reduction goals on our own. The recognition of the complex ecosystem leads to the second factor that I think is so crucial, our collaboration. All sharing a common purpose is one thing, but recognising that we can't get there alone and that we have to work together is vital. This is all the more remarkable when many aspects of our industry, the construction sector, are normally so fiercely competitive. Yet here we all are working in a pre-competitive environment for the common good. Tackling a massive and complex task takes collaboration. I've actually just finished reading a book about the history of the Oxford English Dictionary. Bear with me. It's called The Surgeon of Crowthorn. And I was fascinated to learn that in 1857, when the lexicographers set about the task of recording the exhaustive catalogue of every single word in the English language, they called on over a thousand volunteer experts to collaborate with the full-time staff to compile definitions and quotes of usage to record the origins of all 414,825 English words. Now, we don't quite have the 70 years that it took them to complete the first edition, all 20 volumes of the Oxford English Dictionary. We, we, our task is urgent, but we have quite a lot in common with this other significant task and collaboration is key. What has our do tank been doing? The diagram that should in front of you will be familiar to those who, next slide, will be familiar to those who work with the task, the, the framework of the Task Force on Climate Related Disclosures, the TCFD. Can we go on the next slide, please? There we go. You'll see the concentric circles of influence, Meckler's direct environment, where our founding partners and members our financial supporters, that's where our working groups, our 15 subgroups, the PCG, the Project Control Group, the Project Leadership Group, have held the 60 working group meetings this year already and where our, the, the doing is done. But our wider community, that's attendees at events who aren't necessarily members or people from organisations that are members but aren't necessarily involved in the working groups, people attending to, to earn CBD points. And then beyond that, our wider reach through our newsletter subscriptions, our, our socials, and, and our database. Next slide. The exciting thing there is just some of the facts that underpin our footprint. 250 organisations are involved in our working groups. 450 individuals are engaged in, in those working groups. We've convened 660 working group meetings this year already. That's 10 a month. And so far, 3,500 3, people have signed up to our events. Mecca events are now recognised by the Green Building Council of Australia, Engineers Australia, and the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, RICS, as worthy of CPD points for their members. We've produced 2,000 minutes of content. Yes, maths fans, that's over 33 hours. And our members have written up over 40 case studies to help bust myths and spread, 
spread the what, the how, and the lessons learned of embodied carbon. We've also produced seven major significant publications. All of those numbers really come together to, to show that's why Meckler is called a do tank. Okay, turning to the mechanics of today's session. You've probably seen already that we're recording this event. It's being viewed by over 300 registered attendees and we'll be running it in webinar format. So please use the chat function uh, for comments and questions as often is the case. And as always, I remind you that MECLA members and attendees, I remind you of, of our governance requirements. MECLA does not tolerate any anti-competitive behavior. As I mentioned before, we operate in a pre-competition environment. That's really important. If you're aware of any conflict of interest, please speak up and we will adjust accordingly. So let's get on with it. What have our working groups been doing over the year since our last community event? Let's hear from our amazing co-chairs and then come back for a discussion with all the working group chairs after they've presented. Please remember to keep an eye on the Mentimeter. Now, Anne Austin from Working Group 1, the demand side, can I ask you to please take it away? Thanks so much, Hudson, uh, for that introduction. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm coming to you today from Camaragal land, so pay respects to Elders past, present, emerging, and a shout out to any of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on the line today. Um, I'm lucky enough to be the chair of Working Group 1. Our purpose is around increasing demand. Uh, our hope is that we can send clear, consistent and significantly increased demand signals for low and no embodied carbon materials to the market so that suppliers can be confident in investing in decarbonisation innovation. So this is a purpose we set ourselves um, over a year ago now that we've been working towards in our working group. We are a constantly growing group. <laughs> I lose track of how many are in the team at the moment. We've got over 50. Um, we're predominantly from uh, various levels of government, consultants and head contractors. We don't have many suppliers in our group. We tend to fall more into that sort of part of Meckler. So let me share with you a little bit of how are we trying to increase that um, demand. So after we agreed that purpose, the journey we've been on so far <clears throat> has gone through a couple of different stages. Initially, we were trying to work out who do we need to influence to increase demand for low and no embodied carbon materials. And through a series of surveys and polls, we settled on policymakers, government clients, non-government clients and designers. And so we've been trying to work out how do we as Meckler encourage those people who fall into those categories to increase their ask for low and no body carbon materials. So we brainstormed a whole series of ideas. We had over 100. We got them down to 13. We tested those 13 with people in the Meckler membership and also in New South Wales government. And we chose four initiatives to focus on, which we've formed some subgroups around and they put together plans and we've been actioning those for the last 12 months. So I'll take you through those. We also recently held a one year in reflection and we're considering three new possible subgroups. So if we go to the next slide, I can tell you a little bit about the four active subgroups that we've had in the past year, these on the screen. So we've had one um, subgroup looking at this idea of a pledge prerequisite. So this is a concept of uh, establishing a policy to require head contractors to have a public commitment to reducing embodied carbon as a prerequisite to be able to tender for government work. Uh, so that was our first idea um, and the group have been working on that. Our second idea was to really look into this whole area of measurement and disclosure and including a requirement for new buildings to assess and disclose embodied carbon outcomes as part of a building code or planning requirements. That was another idea we had. The third idea we had was around deviating from a specification or a brief that you've been given. And here it was requesting that clients map the approval process for that deviation to occur, because often it's very difficult to understand how you can put in a non-conforming idea into a government um, bid scenario. And that's 
curbing the uh, potential for there to be low and known body carbon solutions tabled. And our last area that we looked at was a toolkit, some sort of online toolkit to support the policymakers and clients to understand embodied carbon and set policy. So let me go through on the next slide, just a little bit more around each of those. So the idea behind the pledge, we'll look at that one first. This was a concept where governments who have a massive pipeline of work could use the power of that by having a prerequisite for being able to tender to any head contractor that comes in that they must have some sort of pledge to reduce embodied carbon for their organisation. That pledge could be of their own design. It could be a very simple pledge that really has um, very little impact at all commercially on their organisation, such as a percentage of um, cementitious replacement in every concrete mix that they do. Or it could be quite a complex pledge to, say, be a one and a half degree aligned organisation and using science based targets or somewhere in between. But our suggestion has been to policymakers that they require every head contractor to have some sort of pledge so that we all are starting to learn about embodied carbon and talk about it. So we've been taking that idea on tour. Uh, we drafted a sort of policy and we've we've aired that with various um, state uh, bodies and agencies in New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, etc. You can see the list there, federal level as well. And then we've at the moment got um, a two, two states who are considering quite seriously including this concept in their future uh, procurement policy and we hope to be able to make an announcement about one of them imminently. Um, so that group has been very active just basically taking that concept on tour. Even where the pledge itself hasn't been perhaps adopted, one of the things that we have found is that even just having the conversation about it has started to have a lot of those agencies learn more and think more about embodied carbon. The second group that was looking at measure and disclosure, I think it's important to give a bit of context. So at the time, they thought their core strategy was going to be review the current policies and plans and then workshop, you know, potential regulators, administrators and lobby them and propose a suitable framework. Unbeknownst to us, at the same time as we were thinking about it, the Neighbours Group were also then starting to work on their tool. So one of the things that this group has done has met then with various government bodies to try and understand, does Neighbours feel that the new Neighbours tool fill that need that they had identified? And in many, in most cases, we think it will, um, but there have been some gaps identified for where the Neighbours tool doesn't touch certain types of um, uh, typologies in our sector that you know you can't get a neighbours uh, rating for so there may be some gaps that this group would continue then to work with around that whole measurement and disclosure but also perhaps encouraging how the disclosure element will come into play once the neighbours tool lands. The DV8 group um, again had been looking at who are the key decision makers behind deciding whether you can or can't deviate from a specification and they've been testing, they thought that they would go through a process of testing certain approaches with them which is what they've been doing. So that group has a couple of deviation pilot projects where they've been working alongside some of the decision makers in um, various agencies and they've presented some case studies, uh, particularly one around where John Holland group had managed to orchestrate a deviation. And then lastly, our toolkit group uh, were very interested to understand what sort of support might head contractors need to be able to adopt an embodied carbon target uh, pledge. And so they it conducted a series of interviews with seven different head contractors to try and understand what they already do. And they've mapped some um, uh, content that would be relevant to be included on the website and the toolkit. They've bounce that with working group three and four who are looking at that website and they're going to be gifting that piece of work to group three and four to pursue. If we go to the next slide, just the last thing I wanted to share with you is in addition to those four um, things that we've been working over the past few, uh, year, we've come up with three possible new ideas that are um, being developed at the moment and at our next meeting we're going to be deciding whether we will um, be recommending these uh, move forward. The first is to focus on local council. So here the idea is to support local council officers who investigate the measurement and reduction of embodied carbon in their council capital works plan. 
we know that we're sort of targeting them potentially as a unique um, government client and they have a huge amount of work that obviously involves you know, products that have embodied carbon and often they don't have the same sort of depth of um, access to specialists etc and so we were trying to think about how we might be able to better support local councils on their decarbonisation journey. The second idea that we considering as a new possibility was a readiness index. This it was born out of all the conversations we've had with agencies who sometimes are hesitant to place a demand for low embodied carbon outcomes on the market because they're worried industry isn't ready. And so we did get a bit of feedback that they were saying, oh, if we ask industry to do this, will, will that make it really difficult for them to participate um, in our tenders? Will, will that, is that a step too far? And they were actually deeply underestimating the readiness we felt of the market. And so our thought was that we could prepare and share some sort of readiness index or dashboard that has evidence of where the industry is at in in terms of its readiness to use low or no embodied carbon materials so that they're more confident to ask for them. And we're thinking that that might be something where we could perhaps work with a credible researcher to create some sort of survey that recurs on a regular basis that's issued to suppliers and MECA and head contractors, et cetera, that test readiness that might look at numbers of projects that are already in progress with embodied carbon reduction targets or a percentage of products that are in the market, etc. So we're tinkering with that idea. And the third idea we're tinkering with is around planning in, planning incentives. This always comes up. Um, how can we encourage planners, often at that local council level, to adopt mechanisms that would incentivise organisations who are seeking planning approval to drive lower embodied carbon outcomes. So it's pretty easy to think of the incentives. They could be things like a financial pen penalty or a financial benefit for low embodied carbon outcomes, or it could even be additional um, area that you're able to build to if you've got low embodied carbon outcomes. The tricky part is working out how do you encourage planners to adopt those and finance those um, kind of new ideas. So these are the three possibilities that we've got that we may add to our suite. Um, and then we'll be doing a little bit of a, a subgroup spill and reorganising ourselves around the new suite of subgroups. That's it for working group one. And I'll hand over now to Lucy uh, and Caroline, who will take you through working group two. Thanks, Anne, for the handover. My name's Lucy. I'm an environmental designer at Atelier 10 and co-chair of working group two, uh, with, along with Carolyn Nola um, as my uh, other half for working group two evaluation. Next slide, please. So our working group has the purpose of contributing to the advancement of measurement and benchmarking around embodied carbon, and our scope covers materials, buildings, and infrastructure. Uh, since sort of uh, around the middle of 2021, um, we have been tackling this purpose and all its complexity to analyze the opportunities and challenges of using the methodologies to benchmark embodied carbon and with the real aim, as with all the MECLA working groups, to create assets for, for industry and evaluate the current state of play. We have a very diverse working group um, representing designers and suppliers, uh, our tool service providers and database um, custodians, and <clears throat> as well as uh, leadership members uh, at the industry level. We are currently split, <clears throat> my apologies. <clears throat> we are currently split into three subgroups covering our uh, three components of scope, the materials and products, the buildings and the civil linear infrastructure. And each of those is sitting between 10 and 15 um, key participants. Next slide, please. So as I said, we started off in 2021 uh, with a key exploration of defining our scope and, uh, and really identifying the spaces where there is support needed and evaluation needed. We landed on five uh, areas of evaluation, that being the standards that govern measurement and evaluation of embodied carbon, the quantification methods, 
how we compare units across the three different scopes, that being materials, buildings, and infrastructure, the benchmarking of embodied carbon, and the tools and data that help us do this. So a hefty, um, a hefty list to tackle and spent the next sort of 18 months tackling that in a series of subgroups uh, with the production of our upfront carbon in the built environment discussion paper um, is the culmination of uh, yeah that uh, big chunk of work. Uh, it went through a number of surveys internally and externally and uh, we came at the start of this year we came together to share the insights of that process and our spotlight on measuring embodied carbon that's recorded and available as is the discussion paper on the Mekla website. Uh, we can go to the next slide. I'll speak briefly to some of the points on the screen, but I'm hoping to tempt you all to, if you haven't read the discussion paper, to dig deep and uh, check it out on the Mekla website. So in the standards, I'll focus on the barriers because I think that's what takes us forward from here. The, lessons learned on the standards side of things is that there is a lot of complexity. There are standards that are international or um, you know, ISO standards, but there are also industry standards that can be really critical uh, in this conversation. But the major um, takeaway is that the standards associated with broader environmental impact uh, are a separate category to those standards that deal with specifically with carbon and embodied carbon. And that's part of what the work will take forward is going to tackle. At the quantification side, um, barriers include access to data, um, the, the consistency or reliability of data, uh, including, of course, navigating paywalls, and the completeness of data and how that aligns with the standards identified uh, in the previous subgroup. So again, this is something we will be taking forward um, to support industry, particularly those small businesses and new players to materials embodied carbon space. Under comparable units, um, there's really interesting discussion around which units we use to measure embodied carbon at different scopes and for different uh, core materials, and that this can differ between uh, stakeholders, designers and practitioners um, and at different scales. So again, we see a barrier uh, being consistency and it's something that we want to take forward, particularly for our civil and linear infrastructure subgroup, uh, where there is a really broad scope of assets being assessed uh, where appropriate comparable units are needed. Under the benchmarking side of things, we uh, have barriers around consistency and agreement on what is low carbon, and that is a broader MECLA challenge. Uh, that we take on as a consortium. And with the tools and data, uh, transparency and access, again, is a barrier. So looking at the next slide, what we take forward in this year is to try to um, identify and showcase and advocate for how we fill these gaps and even just identifying that these gaps do exist to the broader industry. Next slide, please, Lexi. So that is our three uh, subgroups that we've moved forward with. We've got a 90 degree rotation to focus at the scope level and be able to provide key assets for the broader industry um, yeah, to advocate and guide measurement and evaluation of embodied carbon. And that's what we'll be tackling this year. Uh, next, we've got group three and I'll hand over to Jeremy, I believe. Thanks, Lucy. Um, and I'm not sure whether Haley's with us. Haley, is it just me or are you Haley and you're here as well? It's just you, Jeremy. Okay, no worries. I was tracking you down. So, um, yeah, go to the slides if you like. Uh, so, uh, Haley and I have been co chairs for this working group that has brought together the past working group three and working group four that. Um, has, has had a combined purpose, I guess. One was uh, initially, Working Group 3 was focused on the website and developing up the case studies, and Working Group 4 was on the knowledge side of it in terms of building guidance to support um, and specify and help understand how we um, uh, determine you know, what is uh, request for low-embodied carbon materials to be used on our projects. So we've kind of brought those two 
working groups together in terms of a common set of purposes, um, really to define both common embodied carbon language and develop resources to support the industry on making better decisions towards low embodied carbon materials. Um, so it has a mix of the working group three and four um, uh, working group members, um, and it really is a, a collective mix of um, construction, consultant, government, lawyers, uh, research institutions, so it's a very, uh, and suppliers, so it's a very um, broad mix of, of people. I think we have something like 65 odd in that group, um, but we're only getting about uh, 15, maybe up to 20 at a time. So uh, participation is our key challenge to engage with the working group. Uh, so the working group has had a number of projects and to date um, from the case studies, I think we're up to 21 now, but Alex, you might um, correct me if it's more than that now. Um, there's a, also an embodied carbon uh, dictionary or Mechla dictionary that we produced that helped to really define some of the key terminology. Um, we're working on some legal language and some commonality around that because um, uh, we've identified a bit of a gap in terms of how requests are made from both uh, clients as well as into to supply chain and how do we actually do that in a way that we on understand what the, the, uh, the requests are and how to manage some of the risks in that process. Um, to that end, we're working on our guidance material um, and looking at that at a very broad level. So um, as it says there, it's about helping to um, specify, procure and supply low embodied carbon materials, but it's doing so in a way that looks at the breadth of the project life cycle and the different decisions that might need to be made depending on which stakeholder you are and at what stage of a project you're at. Um, and we've got a bit of a hint uh, of a spotlight event that we'd like to have later in the year, um, a bit of a hypothetical on where does your risk lie about how do you actually achieve your embodied carbon targets when the lots of different dynamics are at play on, on a project. Next slide. To give a bit of an insight in terms of the, the guidance, it's really trying to structure that to help identify the, the key project phases and the key steps, actions, resources, toolkits, and bringing into play, as Anne said, the working group one work, um, to make sure that you can help make better decisions depending on which stakeholder you are and at what stage of a project you're in. Um, so that's certainly a lot of opportunity for us to build out the kind of things that might be relevant for those at an early project initiation phase um, through to those that are actually in the weeds and procuring and needing you know, clearer specifications for particular material products. But there's lots of different decisions to make. And we also acknowledge that there are both not only in body carbon, but now how do you marry in the things like circular um, materiality considerations that actually can help to reduce the embodied carbon impact of materials as well. Um, I think there's a third slide here. Oh, there isn't. Okay. Um, so uh, with that, that probably is my just request to other working groups to highlight that um, we are looking for input across the various resources and templates and other things that are being looked at at very specific material levels um, and very keen to make sure that we're we're building that knowledge base for MECLA and actually the guidance that helps project make better decisions at whatever stage and at whatever stakeholder is involved with that with the um, with projects at that stage. So hopefully that gives a bit of an insight as to what working group three and four are up to. Thanks. And over to Joe, I believe. Thanks, Jeremy. Awesome update. Um, uh, I also want to acknowledge that I'm dialing in from Gadigal land and pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to any Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Hey, I'm so excited to be here with you to talk about working group 5A steel. So uh, of the working group fives, there are a bunch of subgroups which encompass the various high embodied carbon materials that we use regularly in construction. Uh, Haley again, she's, she's <laughs> chairing two groups. Uh, Haley and I co-chair this group, um, and, and really the purpose of the group is to accelerate emissions reductions in steel, mainly through knowledge sharing. So uh, I came into this group early days um, saying, why can't I just buy low embodied carbon steel? I want it off the shelf. I want it available. It should be available to any project, and let's make it happen. Uh, well, as it turns out, what I've learned through the process of engaging with steel manufacturers academics, builders, and government within this working group 
is that it simply is not available necessarily straight off the shelf for the, the main reason uh, that two thirds of the steel that we consume is, is new, is from uh, primary uh, iron making. Uh, and that's where most of the embodied carbon sits. So creating new steel from iron ore is vastly carbon intensive. And there are very few, very low embodied carbon methods to creating that steel. So whilst yes, we can get recycled scrap created in an electric arc furnace that is fed with renewable power, and those opportunities are increasing, it st still only makes up a small uh, one third of the global share of, of steel production. Okay, so what do we do? We, uh, we catch up monthly um, and we develop uh, a range of steel snapshots. So what we're trying to do is um, take this understanding and um, democratize it, send it out to everybody, all of the MECLA membership, um, anybody who wants to learn more about steel, which is one of these hard to abate sectors responsible for 7% of global greenhouse gas emissions used ubiquitously, let's understand you know what what are the opportunities to decarbonize steel manufacturer and uh, and and you know how how, how um, broad are those opportunities? So if we go to the next slide, I just want to show you what the um, uh, the steel snapshots of one or two pagers, three page documents that we're producing. This is sort of where they sit. So we've got we've got up to well, we've got nineteen at the minute that are in the planning phase, either not started, drafted, uh, or complete, and, or with PCG. Um, for approval and publication. Now, eventually, all of these documents will be made available to the public, to MECLA, to really, I suppose, extend our understanding, our industry's understanding of what it really takes to be considered a low embodied carbon steel um, and what are the key investment um, levers to pull. Um, that's it, it's a short and, and sharp one, so ask me any questions in the Q&A. And I would like to hand over to Ali Kashani and Evan Smith, might just be Evan, um, who are chairing the working group 5B, Concrete and Cement. Hey, thanks for that, Joe. That's great. Yeah, just myself today, Ali's uh, up for an award. Um, so let's uh, wish him luck. So uh, next slide, please, Alexi. So yeah, concrete, uh, it's the most used construction material globally after water by weight. It's estimated that seven to eight percent of uh, man-made global emissions are coming from uh, from concrete and cement due to the quantity that we use. If that was a country, it would be the third largest country of like emitter of CO two globally after America and China as well. So, uh, large large quantities are used. Uh, you know, the percentage re reflects that as well. But there's also a lot that we can do to it. The industry has also put out a roadmap of how to get to carbon neutral by by twenty fifty as well. It's a very interesting material. Been working in the sustainability uh, in its last last five years, and I think um, you know the problem is I think currently the situation there there are solutions. Material manufacturers have the solution. Clients want it, but there, it's a complex supply chain between that. You may have you know, five or six or eight different kind of people between that. Um, everyone needs to kind of know about you know, like like carbon concrete, how to ask for it, how to specify, how to talk about it upwardly and downwardsly um, for it to get for us to get it right okay um if someone doesn't feel comfortable or have all the full information it's very easy to kind of say to say no so um that's that's the background what we're really working at we're and we're looking at to take advantage of that like of the, the supply chain as well to take take advantage of and break down those barriers identify what they are as well so the Concrete and Cement Working Group, uh, we meet monthly. We've got about 50 active members uh, across the supply chain. Uh, and approximately a 50-50 split. We've actually started a bit, of, a bit of a register to kind of keep track and, as we work through it as well. And the aim is like, we only want active members in, in the working group as well and have an equal representation as well uh, of that as well. So you need to be active to maintain your involvement in the working group. As I mentioned, it, it's com complex and multifaceted as well. And the solutions that we need are multifaceted and actually require both the supply side and the demand side to, to work together as well. Uh, next slide, thanks. So objective number one is uh, similar to the, the steel working group. We've, we've kind of 
uh, you know, we've put it out, we've asked a lot of people about what, what they guess um, want from this working group and what they get most value from it as well. So the facilitation and collaboration of knowledge transfer for the acceleration, the decarbonisation, so of, of uh, concrete and cement. So we do monthly knowledge sharing presentations. We've been doing that for about two years as well. A lot of work going kind of going into that, arranging speakers um, each month as well. We've tried to flip it a little bit as well and to try and have that balance and also to activate all the members that are in the working group. So all members should you know, bring their perspective along to it. We don't just want to hear from concrete manufacturers, cement manufacturers. We want to hear, you know, as that side, we want to hear what are the demand issues? What are, what are the issues? Where are you at with your problem of trying to use lower carbon uh, concrete and cement as well? So that's just uh, an example of some of the presentations that we had. So we try to balance it each month, one, one for the other as well. Um, the other thing we'll be doing as well is monthly facilitated like a round robin group discussion as well. Initially last year it was like, uh, yeah, what you're working in, what would like, you know, what are you looking for like as a silver bullet or what would you help you uptake lower carbon concrete and cement? Um, this is topic that we're starting on is like what is actually low carbon concrete? We mentioned it uh, a lot in the working group, but, you know, what would you put your hand on as, as the definition of it? How is everyone actually defining it? So for all our members, going back to that previous slide from the supply side and the demand side, what, how are people measuring it? What are they measuring it against? What reference cases are they using it? Um, what targets or reductions are they aiming for? And, and what are the resources, the information that you know about this as well? So we're not reinventing the wheel. So we've actually started a bit of a repository. As we go through that, everyone has to participate in the conversation as well. And that um, goes on to our next uh, objective as well. Next slide, thanks, Alexi. So the second objective is to advocate on behalf of the sector to mitigate uh, recognised problems in the decarbonisation. So feeding then on from that knowledge transfer of like what, how are you defining, where are you currently at as well. We actually want to build that into, um, you know, as a survey, capture all those discussions and you know, formulate a draft for review of, of the group of, of the state of the nation and then potentially take that through to, you know, um, a resource on, on the MECLA working group as well. Like, what is like carbon concrete as a group? What do we think the definition is? How do we think it should be measured? Uh, and, and what against what our thoughts? And, you know, have that out there as well, you know, and also work in conjunction with what else has been done there as well. So on the right side, an example, like as we go through and each person talks about this as well, they're like, oh, have you seen this race? Have you still seen that? These people are kind of looking at that. So AIM is also part of that discussion paper is like have like a one-stop shop for all the different references specifically uh, for concrete as we kind of work through those discussions as well. There's a second part to, to that objective as well. Um, it's also performance-based specifications. So last year we did have a separate working group looking at performance-based specifications of, of concrete, how we can move away from prescriptive specifications about X amount of cement or, or this or that to um, actually performance out-based gum. That was getting quite large and unweirdly and resource consuming as well. So. Um, I'm happy to kind of announce actually that the CCIA and Smart Crew actually taking the lead on that. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly complex um, challenge as well. They just had a, a really great webinar on that the other day and they're kicking off some workshops on that as well. So I think that's really the, the grunt and the horsepower that we need for that. Um, I just got to finish by closing. There's two great Spotlight events uh, on the Meckler website for Spotlight to, in concrete as well. So check those out if you haven't seen them already. Thanks for that. And then uh, over to the next working group as well, Jeff, for um, aluminium or alumina, they say in the US. <laughs> thanks, Evan. Um, yeah, I've un unlearned how to say that. So thanks very much. I'm an architect and principal at Hassel in our Sydney studio. And I suppose for nearly the last two years, I've been um, chairing and co-chairing um, the aluminium working group um, to quite a lot of fun. And, and I'm pleased to report some great success so really our purpose has been about understanding the challenges and importantly, the opportunities uh, for a low embodied uh, aluminium future in the Australian built environment. You know, historically, aluminium hasn't had the same level of focus or interest as other materials, um, but um, it is typically the third largest contributor to a building's embodied carbon after concrete and steel. And, you know, compared to um, concrete can be up to 100 times more intensive per kilogram of material. So, we knew we had a lot on our hands to kind of educate um, the, the built environment kind of ecosystem. So yeah, it, it's been a really good journey uh, so far. Um, we've been quite 
uh, strategic in composing our group's membership, uh, which you know I think probably fluctuates between 15 to 20 members with broad representation from suppliers, manufacturers, contractors, and consultants like myself. I think um, this diversity has been really helpful in understanding the range of issues that we face, but also importantly how um, they're interrelated and how best to address them. We've gone through a, a sort of a multi-phased uh, looped approach where we really started by first gathering the information and understanding what the issues really were, and then distilling those down uh, into something clear and manageable. We shared our first um, uh, publication, Mechler publication on low and body carbon aluminium, which is a bit of a primer, a short uh, 10 page document. Um, and that was really outlining those key challenges around um, how uh, aluminium is produced, why is it so carbon intensive, um, you know, where is it available, um, and what are some of the procurement challenges around that. Um, and that really started our the sharing that we've been on. So um, we're, what, we're, what we found is that, you know, having um, the first and second spotlight events uh, kind of coinciding with the release of this document was the beginning of, of us sharing our information, but we're, we're continuing to share and share again. And I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, and that probably speaks to this looped approach about um, feeding back into our learnings and new developments. Uh, and opportunities out there, but also really um, about more broadly understanding the work that others um, um, that are kind of around the periphery or sometimes uh, dip into the group, what sort of work and research they're doing is happening across the industry to broaden our working group's knowledge. Um, the most important point really though is to empower action across the industry. And we're definitely seeing that from, from where we started. Um, next slide, please. Oh, is that the second slide? Yeah. Um, so, our objectives are really, like I said, about educating the built environment ecosystem as best we can. Um, that includes uh, my consultant colleagues, builders, suppliers, and importantly, the owners and developers who really sort of shape and, and create the projects that, that many of us work on. I suppose an important part of this journey has been really busting myths, particularly, particularly on price and quality, but also about availability, which um, you know is not unusual to find on a topic when it's so kind of relatively new. Um, but I'm really pleased to say, and I'm happy that uh, Hudson shared and gave a, a shout out to Aluminium at the beginning. Um, we have really seen quite remarkable progress across the value chain. And in particular, as he mentioned with our working group member, Capril, who have recently launched the two low carbon products to market in Australia. They've also um, recently announced uh, an Australian first um, agreement with Tomago Aluminium, um, uh, New South Wales's largest aluminium smelter for recycling a lot of their um, post-production scrap. And I think there will be others to follow and increasing that sort of quantity as the years and months go on. Um, so I think it's you know fair to say that um, we are certainly seeing a lot of interest, not just from um, from our kind of working group members, but across the industry. And you know, it's kind of been really evident through posts across LinkedIn, research publications being um, uh, published. It's it's really been quite quite remarkable. Um, I also think that a lot of the clients that I work with are starting to report back on questions that they've started to ask of their supply chain, um, which you know really just shows the progress they're making that one or two years ago simply I don't think would have happened. Um, but the two biggest barriers probably still remain. Uh, I think that's really time and availability. And that really comes down to the way we procure our buildings, um, how we procure our, in particular our facades, but then how do we adapt um, and plan around those um, sort of um, programs. Um, currently, we are uh, in a process of broadening our understanding through an outreach phase, connecting with external groups. We have hosted um, a session just recently with the Australian Energy Transition Initiative, looking um, at the work that they did for federal government um, around aluminium in particular. And upcoming, we have a session with uh, Corio, the Circular Economy Consultant Space out of Brisbane, and Deloitte and the Australian uh, Aluminium Council, looking at their research paper called uh, Cast Anew, which was looking at uh, circular econo economy opportunities um, in the aluminium value chain. And finally, we've been a quite a busy group um, raising awareness and spreading the word. Um, we published our low carbon aluminium brochure um, just over a year ago. We've held two spotlight events and three deep dives, which were very, very, um, I think, critical to raise our awareness where we, we focus with different three different groups of, across the ecosystem, kind of learning from one and, and sharing the information on to the next. And finally, I'd just like to conclude, uh, we have a one pager and a specific specification guide, which are currently with the BCG for review and comment, and hopefully will be with the broader community and, and public uh, shortly. 
And I uh, would like to now hand over to uh, Kathy and uh, Josephine for Working Group 5D, Other Materials. Thank you, Jeff, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kathy Inglis. Um, I'm the General Manager at Brickworks in Innovation and Technical, and I'm also a National Director at the Housing Industry Association. My fabulous co-chair is Dr. Josephine Vaughan, who is a lecturer at, that says WSU, it's actually the University of Newcastle, so I'll just correct that one. Um, so our working group 5D, the other work, the other working group fives are all the major um, higher in, high embodied carbon materials. We make up the rest of the building materials. So that's everything, bricks, masonry, roof tiles, uh, pipe, pipes, glass and windows, asphalt. Um, we do have some materials that are missing and we're, we're hoping to get them on board. And two are probably the obvious ones are insulation and plasterboard. But currently, so we're a very broad group, which makes it quite difficult to focus on anything specific. Um, but what we have been focusing on um, with our group, because we're such a broad range of construction material suppliers, we also have a whole lot of enablers in our group that are made up with university academics, builders, architects and government members. So we've been focusing a lot on working with the government agencies, to discuss the barriers, particularly around recycled materials and recycled content, but also the research the universities are doing that would help enable us I suppose you'd look at it as smaller materials in contribution to carbon in the building industry, that how we can focus on getting the carbon down. So we look a lot at the circularity and utilization of waste materials. There are many, many opportunities in that area um, so that we can supplement our raw materials in a broad range of products. We have about 40 plus working group members. Um, most meetings we get sort of 20 to 25, um, and we have regularly have presentations at our meetings, which are really good, particularly from the government bodies and some researchers in the area that are working on amazing products. We've just broken into a range of subcommittees to focus on um, more specifically on the individual products. So we have asphalt, glass and windows, masonry bricks and roof tiles, and plastic pipes. We did have timber, but they've now spun off in their own group and they're gonna report soon. So next slide, please. So our key objective at the moment is now to develop templates for roadmaps for each of the other materials so that we can focus on the landmarks for each materials. So we get an, a good measure to understand the embodied carbon that we develop benchmarks and the barriers of these markets. Being smaller products, it's, there's sometimes some significant barriers to focus on that, but also strategies for some com, com, to develop concise information with known ways to get closer to zero carbon or to at least get to lower carbon. Um, we're also looking at beyond, in these roadmaps for the templates that we actually have looked beyond carbon. So other decisions on the impact of environmental criteria, not just carbon as well. Um, so we're working through that now. And the next slide, please. Some of our amazing members individual companies and associations that are part of our group are already developing material on their products that we hope to use these as a guide to develop the roadmaps for um, our, our group and for other materials that will eventually come in and want to be part of MECLA. So these members are leading the way with um, examples for life cycle analysis, looking at disposable reuse and recycle and the carbon footprint, and then with environmental product declarations. So we're harnessing all that enthusiasm by some of the individual members now into our subgroups and to develop the templates for the roadmaps going forward. So now I'll hand over to Working Group 5E, which is Building Services, to Jeff and Mark. Hi. Uh, so I'm Jeff Robinson, and I'm uh, joining you from uh, Bunurong land in uh, sunny Melbourne. And uh, my co-chair is Mark Vendor will come um, uh, after me. And it's great, actually, that this working group has gone after the, um, the steel and aluminium and plastic folk, because we need those working groups to do lots and lots of work to get the embodied carbon down. So the section that we look uh, after, which is building services, um, is the raw materials that we're looking at are uh, 
our um, our lower end body carbon. So our um, our focus is really on the um, driving the development and uptake uh, of low embodied carbon building services. And as you can imagine, um, given the fact of the complexity of building services and the fact that it's in many different industries, um, both the building industry in um, in uh, and in infrastructure, it has a very, very important role to play. So the first part we felt when we sort of got the working group together, um, we sort of looked at a number of the uh, members and allied organizations. And we felt that the most important thing initially was to raise the awareness of the need to reduce embodied carbon in the building services industry. And I think that was really important because a lot of the focus in building services over the last number of years has actually been in reducing um, uh, operational carbon to go and make building services more efficient and so on. But uh, so there was a fair amount of work or is a fair amount of work to do to raise that awareness that actually we also need to look at reducing the embodied carbon of services. And associated with that, we've really focused on um, what can we do to improve the measurement and benchmarking of um, uh, embodied carbon and building services, and also uh, to help the manufacturers and suppliers by demonstrating that there's um, low, uh, there's actually demand for low carbon building services. Um, we have a pretty uh, diverse group of people um, in our working group. We've got consultants, we've got some developers, contractors, manufacturers, uh, some government folk, equipment suppliers, um, and industry bodies. And um, the working group has about 40 people, and I would say probably be about maybe uh, 10 or 12 kind of um, join our regular meetings. I'm going to hand over to uh, Mark now to talk about some of the uh, individual uh, projects and things we've been involved with. Thanks very much, Jeff, and uh, very happy to be joining you all here today from uh, Wurundjeri lands. Um, so Jeff's already spoken, I guess, about the, you know, the, the, the ideas behind Working Group 5E. Um, in terms of our objectives, one of the things we do, building services by its nature um, is, is quite often invisible. Um, people only tend to notice building services when they're not working. Um, so we do um, serve the purpose of getting involved in conversations about embodied carbon um, and providing input um, from the experts that are part of our working group. Um, and also, like Jeff said, you know, the focus tend is, tends to be on operational emissions coming from building services. So um, we're, we're aiming to increase awareness um, of embodied carbon in our space by organising events. So um, some of the things that we've done so far in our working group, um, I think uh, a couple of people have mentioned that neighbours are developing a framework for embodied carbon. Um, and there was a consultation open earlier this year that different working groups within MECLA provided input for, and um, our group was one of those. Uh, we've also um, carried out, we've, we've undertaken a couple of sessions um, to increase awareness. So um, there's specific meetings with um, groups of manufacturers to try and increase awareness there and also understand the issues that the uh, manufacturers are facing. And in other industry events that um, are targeting building services professionals, so um, those organised by um, ERA, my organisation and other organisations like SIBSI, um, that, that go out to people in our profession to talk more about um, embodied carbon. And we're currently working towards a, a spotlight event for, for a wider audience. And, and I guess part of that is targeting these stakeholders who we think aren't um, necessarily up to speed on embodied carbon. So that at the moment, we're looking at manufacturers, um, architects, government procurement teams, and um, building occupants as well. Um, one thing we've seen in our group, um, Jeff mentioned the need for benchmarking and measurement and, and how it is difficult in building services because it's not just one material. Um, you know, uh, an HVAC system, for example, is made up of lots of different materials. 
Um, so what we are seeing is that the consultants, especially in our group, they're all working in their own teams, um, trying to measure this stuff and find ways of reducing embodied carbon. So our group tends to share a lot of information about the different projects they're working on. And, and I guess what I noticed there is a huge desire and, and, and will to, to um, get this work going, which is, which is really encouraging. And um, we're also working on it. We've got a standard slide deck that we've used before, but um, it's something that we're also changing for the, the different stakeholder groups that I mentioned just now, who, where we think that there's a, a potential to raise awareness. So lots of work to do. Um, I think that in some ways, um, building services probably um, is coming in a little bit later than some of the other materials in terms of awareness and the work that's going on. But, but we know that it is a really important area uh, to get done as well. And with that added complication, I suppose, as, as Jeff mentioned, that we, we have to make sure that these systems um, are good operationally, but also in terms of embodied carbon. So um, that's uh, the building services group. And uh, we'll move on now to engineered timber. So I'm going to hand over to Stephen and Hamid. Thank you, Mark. Fantastic, everyone. Great to be here today. Um, Hamid sends his apologies, but um, I will uh, take us forward today for the engineered timber update. And I'm coming to you from Daramurugal country today up in the Karingo lands. So working group five, engineered timber, our purpose from the outset has really sort of focused around how to improve the adoption of engineered timber in uh, low to mid rise buildings in, in the industry. And, you know, I think very similar to building services, this group is sort of, is, is a more recently formed group, might've come out of the other materials I think Kathy mentioned, but, um, in December last year, there was a, a series of barriers as a first sort of cut put together by the um, attendees in the group at that time. I joined in January. Um, and since that time, we've uh, had a series of uh, industry presentations on a couple of topics to date with, with more to come. But our approach in strategy really is a two pronged approach with a focus on identifying of the key barriers um, what are those perceptions and barriers limiting the more widespread use of timber in the industry? But not forgetting um, the purpose of why we are here with MECLA, and that is also to identify and gather data via um, industry bodies and leaders in, in assessing the embodied carbon metrics, particularly around the process uh, with engineered timber from harvest all the way through to uh, erection. Of, of built form. Our, uh, our key objectives at the moment, uh, focusing on two to three items really, to research these areas, report on and seek advocacy with the aim to influence real tangible outcomes in standards and industry services within a 12 month period. Look, it may or may not reach three items. At the moment, the subgroups we have formed just quite recently, we've only had a, a single um, catch up in subgroups as of um, May. We're entering our second rolling month for June. And those groups at the moment consist of insurance and regulatory um, backgrounds. We have a diverse group and a large group under supply chain. And another area is financial cost uh, and logistics. Next slide. The membership for our group here is uh, quite diverse. We do have quite a, a number of suppliers and they are the dominant numbers in the group. Manufacturers, designers, consultants, engineers, builders, we have academics, we have developers such as myself, we have advocacy groups and other related associations. And our attendance similar to others while we have a, a total group member list of around 60 to 65 members, we do have a rolling 50, 15 to 20 odd people per month and it can vary um, based on people's availability. The objectives of the group are to identify the barriers like, like elsewhere, uh, the needs 
and educate the team and the industry on how to approach uh, product use, i.e. timber. And the timeline for these objectives that we've set ourselves at the moment is a nine to 12 month period with a staggered outcome, hopefully, uh, of providing some um, information back to the MECLA database. The progress thus far, being in the early stages of strategy, it's really been around research within each of the, the subgroups, and there is quite a focused approach within the subgroups, almost to a siloed effect in a way, and we need to sort of break that down across our group in our monthly catch-ups. We've had two presentations to date from industry um, wide experts, one on a single case study of uh, engineered mass timber building um, out at Bella Vista and also an update to the NCC around fire, um, which was uh, completed some years back, but it's great background information to sort of take on board here and, and move forward with. Um, and we are looking to bring in um, another speaker next month to fulfill one of our other subgroup areas and that is insurance. Our main barriers to unlock here, as touched on earlier, are insurance and the perceptions around that, fire and cost. And in doing this, we really do need to rely on our industry colleagues and the data that we can extract. And I know that the data sometimes is, is always hard to get real actual data, but we will see what we can come up with and um, tap on our uh, network and our resources and try and come back to Jeremy's group with some information to help sort of provide uh, more substance to the guideline database. Our engagement is uh, really with contractors in the industry and uh, timber associations, mainly around costs and insurance. And then the next step is really towards standards and improving those standards. Our outputs to date have been minimal. We've been doing a lot of sort of internal soul searching, research, education, formulating a strategy for the group, but we do intend on putting together a, a, an upcoming myth busting session for the next uh, few months. And I, I feel ultimately the group's best position with Timber really is to break down some of the metrics around um, carbon, have a look at EPDs in, in absolute detail um, and feed it back into the guideline database under working group three and four. And that's really where we are on Timber. I'll hand you now uh, over to working group six residential with uh, Carla and Julia. Thanks, Stephen. And so you can go to the first slide, please, Alexi. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Carla Fox Reynolds. Um, I'll be, I'll present on the first slide and then I'll hand over to Julia to present on the second slide. Um, so Julia and I have just joined as co-chairs for Working Group 6 for Residential, I think a month ago, approximately. Um, so the Working Group did begin about six months ago, but um, came into a couple of challenges with some health issues, um, can't be avoided. So we're sort of almost re-kicking off um, and our first meeting sort of with myself and Julia as co-chairs will be next week. So what we'll speak to today is um, more so the idea of why this working group has been set up as a separate piece to the other working groups. Um, so our purpose is to create large scale demand, to raise awareness and to build capacity to increase the use of low embodied carbon solutions in the residential building sector. So the logic for a separate residential working group is in recognition of the varied and complex challenges, but also the unique opportunities that surround this sector um, and that makes it quite different to the commercial sector. Uh, the residential sector was responsible for more than 50% of the construction industry's embodied carbon in 2022. Um, at the moment the sector is experiencing some sustained economic pressure, uh, supply and labour constraints, high price of land, increasing interest rates that we're all feeling right now. Um, it's become well even more so than Previously, it's become even more broadly resistant to change. However, the demand is high um, and using this opportunity to influence the, the sector's business as usual is probably more important than ever. Um, it is possibly even possible that zero or low embodied carbon solutions could potentially provide the sector with solutions that enable further progress. 
Um, through this group, we will be addressing single residential as well as apartment buildings, um, noting that as part of the whole industry, though they, they are at a very stage of maturity due to the involvement of different players, as well as other factors. Um, as, as I said, the, the working group has been in existence for about six months, and there are four sub-working groups that have previously been agreed to. These include leadership, culture, finance, and quick wins. So one of our first tasks over the um, next two meetings will be to, to, to discuss, um, agree, and then activate those sub-working groups. So it's going to be an exciting time for all of us. And I'll hand over to Julia for the second slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carla. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, um, the demand for low carbon homes is um, a bit lower because it's not at the moment driven by home buyers due to a lot of other constraints that they have. Um, and so what we really want to do as part of this working group um, as the first step is to use make that collaborative model to leverage and support the early adopters um, so that we can demonstrate that there are um, solutions for low carbon residential buildings. Um, we want also to identify and disseminate quick wins. So for example, that could be uh, case studies or piloting low carbon homes or um, developing guidelines on um, some um, uh, specific buildups or elements that would really help to um, uh, reduce uh, embodied carbon on uh, homes and apartments. Uh, and we also want to raise signal awareness and capabilities, so either um, via regulations, but also looking at the customer's journey and how we can raise awareness on the home buyer side. Um, looking at how we can potentially uh, engage and look at opportunities with the finance sector as well. Um, for example, we've seen that there is um, there is uh, mortgage uh, benefits with homes that have low energy use. Is it something that could be replicable for uh, low embodied carbon? Um, and yes, yeah, there is a lot of opportunities that uh, have been part of the early stage discussion, and it's very exciting. I feel that um, there is a lot that we can look at. Um, in terms of the strategy, what we would want to do that there is already a lot of um, uh, resources that were produced by the other working groups, so we want to make sure that this is leveraged uh, for the residential sector. Uh, and um, we also want to look at um, uh, redefining the different subgroups uh, and agree on the key objective of each of them, as well as what will be um, the deliverables. Um, as we're a new group, we are um, looking for new members. So at the moment, we are well represented um, uh, across the industry with people from the government, from uh, development side, uh, designers, uh, manufacturers, builders, um, uh, and more. But if, if um, you would like to join, you're very welcome to join. Uh, I think we would be uh, especially interested if you have contacts in the financial system or social and affordable housing uh, and volume builder. Thank you very much um, and um, can get back to you soon. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much to our co-chairs for running us through everything that you've been doing. Um, it's really quite amazing. I know I set out a whole lot of stats at the beginning, but to hear from you individually really underlines just how much has been going on. And looking, I, I hope some of you have had a, an eye on the Q&A that's um, in very active discussion at the moment. Some of the complexity, some of the challenges, some of the questions that are coming up, and I'd really now like to invite each of the uh, co-chairs who has spoken, pop your camera on and let's have a chat. Let's uh, tackle and, and maybe just go back to some of the questions in the Q&A. Um, but yeah, emphatically, thank you guys, um, men and women. It really is just amazing all of the pullering togethering that you're doing. I mentioned the Oxford English Dictionary and pullering togethering definitely isn't in there, but as an action of collaboration, uh, it's a concept that I like. Um, 
the leadership that goes into this, the small act of leadership, the prodding questions, bringing people in, uh, it's just so important. So um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one of the questions, Joe, can I turn to you about the steel group? One of the questions um, in in the Q and A, I know you've responded, but I think it's a I think it's a good one. Uh, Rick Walters has asked us about, you know, are, are you giving up on primary steel? Now I know you're not, and I know you've said you're not, but could you just unpack that a bit? Because, you know, you were quite honest. Well, you were very honest there, saying initially you were kind of banging the table, saying, "Come on, I want it now." And through the exploration of the complexity, you've grown to understand, well, it ain't that easy, mm. but it doesn't mean we're giving up by any means. Can mm. you talk to that question around primary steel and what the opportunity is and where technologies are going? Absolutely. So with primary steel making, there are a couple of options on the horizon uh, that can seek to decarbonize um, the, the creation of steel from iron ore. Um, and and the, probably the most promising is direct reduced iron or DRI using hydrogen as a reductant. Now, as we know, hydrogen can be created from electrolysis using vast amounts of electricity, renewably, renewably sourced electricity uh, to create hydrogen and then use it as a reductant. Um, so that is something that's being explored in Sweden with the H2 project, um, hybrid is, is the example. Um, there are other examples, and uh, you, you mentioned Wyala um, there, Rick, which is has been a big announcement. Um, I, I don't think that we've seen the, um, you know, obviously hasn't come to fruition yet. Um, for me, I think the first thing we need to do is consume less, right? The reality is we can't just uh, innovate our way out of this mess, okay? Um, the amount of hydrogen that is needed to be created to to transition to 100% hydrogen is enormous. Um, and again, every time we convert energy, we lose, you know, we, we have that, those losses of efficiency. Um, and so the, the first and most important thing I think we can do is get our demand back down to match the steel that we already have in the system, such that we can create a truly circular economy. But when we look at the World Steel Institute um, and, and what they're suggesting for demand, forecast demand, it's that it, it continues to increase. Um, Haley, would you have anything to add? Yeah, um, hi everybody. Uh, apologies for being late to this, but um, Rick, I know you and I've had many conversations about this and I think that the one thing that steel's probably got a little bit differently than other industries is that it is a global industry. Um, and that we aren't just looking at Australia here. We want to make sure that we're setting up um, institutions that's going to decarbonise the steel industry globally. So we don't want to do anything that um, inhibits that uh, from a global standpoint. Um, and our Australian um, manufacturers are small scale compared to the big industries that are overseas. So in many ways, we're sort of... Um, innovation takers in that sense um, and there is a lot of song and dance around some of the new technologies that look promising but aren't commercialized yet we're definitely keeping our finger on the pulse about a lot of those that are coming through you mentioned a couple but there's many 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 more that we talk about in our working group um, we and like I said we are putting together snapshot explainers to try and um, communicate what they are and how likely they are to come to market some of the barriers as to what they are there and how we can uh, work to reduce those coming through I reduce the barriers and, and bring some of this stuff to market as quickly as possible. Um, but I think when it comes to steel, there's two things that are really important. Um, the first thing is, yes, can we measure what the embodied carbon is of the steel that you're receiving um, and making sure you get a really good EPD um, to come through and give you exactly what that is. But the second one is that it's just checking to make sure that your manufacturer is on a pathway to decarbonize. So whether you're looking at a primary steel maker or a secondary steel maker, all of those, um, you know, there's no EAF furnace out there that's perfect that can't improve either. So we just want to make sure that all manufacturers are actually working to reduce it. It's not about being primary or secondary. It's around taking the whole industry along the ride there. Hayley, thank you. And a, a quick shout out to you. Uh, we heard your daughter burnt her foot and you've come from the hospital. So uh, yeah. definitely above and beyond the call of duty to be um, that stressful as a parent. So I hope your daughter's okay and thank you for, for joining us. But please, if you need to go and tend to your daughter, um, by, all, by all means, please do. Best wishes. Thank you, Hudson. Um, that 
Um, the, the comment you made, Joe, there about circularity, I think is a great segue to one of the other questions. And I want to bring Anne Austin into the conversation here around demand that, you know, one of the questions really saying, you know, are we asking for more than just, you know, just reduced embodied carbon in our demand in the ask, you know, in, in growing growing the demand for, for low embodied carbon? Yes, that's what we're asking for. But are we asking for, yet yeah, think about embodied carbon, but think about the whole of life, think about um, design, think about designing out um, carbon. H how would you respond to that, Anne? We're actually trying to keep it super simple. Um, the f we're, we're, we're quite agnostic about how you get to reduce your embodied carbon in the conversations that we've been having. The reality is we're going to have to pull all those levers to reduce to get to the reductions in embodied carbon that we need. So we're going to have to design differently. We're going to have to innovate our materials. We're going to have to use less of our materials and circularity will be absolutely fundamental to achieving that. So all of those mechanisms are going to need to be pulled. We are simply trying to get the conversation happening. Mm. Uh, when we started this journey, um, in my, in my role as Head of Sustainability for Lendless, we actually went and spent some time with our suppliers, you will have remembered Hudson, interviewing them about where are the barriers and what's, you know, and one of the things that was really clear in that piece of research is that without an ask, you never get the answer. And so mm -hmm. unless there's a really consistent request coming from the client, to the head contractor that then flows through, be it to the designer, be it to, you know, the supply chain, et cetera, but at least that starts that whole conversation that we will just be locked forever in where we are. Um, and so, uh, you know, we would love to be at the point of sophistication where we have government agencies coming saying, exactly what should we be asking for? <laughs> should we be requiring circularity? Should we be requiring that, et cetera? But to be honest, we're probably a step before that. We're like at that very front door saying, hello, have you heard of embodied carbon? Do you realize it's a problem? This is why we think we need to be addressing it. And yeah. we think you hold the key. And for, for many of them, that's, that's you know, they're way past that. And for some agencies, they're right at that very early stage of needing that. So um, it's not that we're choosing actively not to mention design or circularity or materials or anything. It's more that we're just going for that very high level. Please start asking the industry to reduce embodied carbon. Okay. Well, at, that makes a lot of sense. And it's consistent with what we heard from the APCC, Australasia Procurement Construction Council, with their their pathway to get, you know, sustainable construction from the procurement perspective. But the first thing is what questions need to be asked. So um, it, it's it's terrific that they're seeking input from, from MECLA for that part of the the, the, the change that's needed. And it, come, it brings us back to the, the founding concept of the ecosystem that we're all moving forward rather than just the supplier or just the builder. It's, it's, it's the design, it's the procurement, it, it's all of us. Everybody has to. Yeah. Every, everybody. I want to ask Jeff a question about aluminium and then Kathy about other materials. Jeff, we heard, I, I gave the example of capital and uh, Anne just mentioned the, the initial foundation research we did and a couple of times I was in discussions along with Monica Richter hearing, oh, there's just no demand for green aluminium in Australia. Now, you were a breath of fresh air saying, well, I've just come back from overseas and bloody hell, there is over there. And I've got, I'm looking for facades that are green aluminium. What's going on in Australia, Hudson? Yeah. Now, we heard that Capital's got its, its doors and window frames for, with lower embodied carbon at no margin. Where, where, where are we up to with facades, which... Obviously, we can see when we see a, a, a big building in one of our metro areas. Where are they at? Sure, thanks. Uh, really good question. I mean, uh, I guess facades is a really complex question, uh, particularly because of the way um, we procure our facades. So when we talk about the, the kind of larger buildings in town, um, a lot of those facades, if not, you know, the vast, vast majority of them come from overseas, particularly from either Southeast Asia or China. Um, and I think also compared to other works packages, the facade package is is also much more complex. It can have up to 50 or 70 more different suppliers, you know, down to every little less screw, gasket, blind, um, all those sorts of elements. So they're dealing with really complex supply chains. Um, and I think the reality that we found out um, initially was that um, in the Australian context, no one had ever asked 
a supplier or a facade manufacturer, you know, where does your aluminium come from? And what, you know, I remember the first time I asked it of a large uh, fabricator, they looked at me blankly and, and shrugged. Um, now that same supplier is actually going to Capital and saying, hey, look, um, if we gave you our dyes, could we, um, could we extrude some of our products here locally? So mm. I, I would never have kind of seen that coming, you know, when we started this journey two years ago. Um, so yes, um, a lot, a lot has kind of progressed in that time, but also, you know, clients, consultants asking questions, you know, that they, like I said, they wouldn't have asked before and, and getting, getting answers back, which is very, very encouraging. Fantastic. Uh, that, that momentum that's building up, as I said before, I don't think any single one of us wants to be saying that's, that's, that's my work, but collectively that's our work. And so, yeah, great, great stuff. Um, Kathy, can I turn to you with the other materials? And I appreciate the, how complex it is having the catch-all of everything else, as you put it. But what's what's the ask? What's the demand that you're seeing for low emission bricks or, or low emission asphalt or uh, other materials? There's certainly a demand for it coming from the market. Um, it's it's interesting. It's it's probably pockets of it, um, mm -hmm. and it's more at the um, higher end of the higher end of the market, the big higher tier builders asking for it rather than the, you know, I suppose the, the well, it's not not coming from the housing industry, definitely, which so is great. We've got a residential group now. But it is that demand, but it's it's very pocketed and it's very hard because it's it's not one of the big contributors. It gets ignored a lot, like what's the contribution of, you know, windows or um, uh, masonry blocks or pavers or whatever, landscape materials, whatever they might be. They're, they're small in comparison to other things, but it does contribute. So it's something that needs to be focused on. Um, so th there is some great work being done and a lot of demand for it. Um, the Ashfeld industry, I know there's been trials with particularly a lot of recycled materials coming in and lowering the carbon footprint. Um, there are low, there are carbon neutral bricks in the market now um, and, and a range of other products are working on those. So we're trying to harness all that together so that some of the other materials can learn from that and gradually grow the, the all the other materials knowledge. Great. Thank, thanks, Kathy. Yes, it, it, it's easy to say, oh, that's just a small one, but it's a bit like global emissions. Oh, small countries don't have to worry. Well, actually, <laughs> when you add them up, it does matter. So that's why we need to be looking at all, at all of it. Yeah. Um, Lucy, a question for you and the, and the measurement group. Uh, I've seen a bit of chatter about EPDs. Now, I, I appreciate that the, the, the group is broader than just to focus on EPDs, but they are an important tool um, and they're not as widespread as, as we would like. What, what can we do as MECLA to increase the, 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 the take up, the understanding and the use of EPDs and other tools? Yeah, I think it's, we've heard today and it's been commented that um, material and product uh, measurement and declaration, whether that's an EPD or a carbon reporting label or um, declaration are key to sharing and celebrating and defining what is a low carbon material. Uh, there's quite exciting work coming, uh, updates coming out of the US about government funding of um, emissions declarations for products. Um, and I think identifying this gap particularly for the small businesses, the new players um, is, and then advocating that towards those decision makers who might be able to um, support and provide resourcing to get more people at the table is mm -hmm. key to our working group and I think to the MECLA mission. Great. Th thank, thanks, Lucy. I, and I, I recognise that's, that's a, a contested space um, so it's fantastic the collaborative progress you, you've been able to make. Um, really appreciate it. Look, I'm really sad that we're we're out of time. This has been terrific. We've got more speakers than we have time to uh, draw out from your groups. But look, thanks for putting in the time to present today, particularly to Kalia and Julia, who've really stepped in um, to fill a gap. But as we've heard, and your own stat that 50% of total construction emissions can be attributed to, to resi, to residential. So glad you're on board. And uh, the call out for new members from those desired areas, please, um, if you've dialed in today and you think, hey, yeah, that could be something I could contribute, please do so.
it is about contribution. And so thank you very much for dialing into everybody. A special thanks to our, our speakers, our co-chairs. Um, you really do make the do tank work. It's, it's just fantastic. So thanks everybody for joining today, contributing questions. I haven't been able to get to all of them, but like all other events, this adds to our, our pool of resources available on the Meckler resources page. I encourage you to keep up to date, check that out. You'll be sent a, if you register for this, you'll also be sent a, a link to a recording of today's, today's event. I particularly want to express my gratitude to WWF for their continued support, co-funding, and for backing Monica Richter, who has brought her brand of systems thinking, her endless optimism, and determination to make Mechler succeed. A big thank you also to Kati Verhayen and Alexi Barnstone from Climate Kick. Climate Kick is another key part of Mechler. Um, and they keep our secretariat working. Their dedication, good humour, and particularly IT skills on a day like today really are the threads that connect us all and keep our moving parts moving. So thanks, guys. Uh, as ever, keep an eye out on the Meckler updates and relative on LinkedIn for what's happening, relevant industry happenings. Um, now, our next event is actually geographically specific. We're hosting... Um, uh, an event in Western Australia, really wanting to, to get action moving, um, continuing to move in Western Australia. It's an in-person in invitations are, are going out um, today. That'll be on the 26th of June, hosted uh, thanks to Engineers Australia, uh, with a focus very much on embodied carbon in the WA context. Uh, and keep an eye out for, for coming events. When we get together and plan what's coming, I'm always a bit daunted by how are we going to get all that done? Well, we, we manage and it's it's with people like you that make that happen. So thank you very much, everybody. For now, that's it. Thank you for joining us. As always, I look forward to seeing you again. Thanks, everyone.